First, I wanted you to hear from a different solicitor. I've been going around this state for a year and a half now talking about the need for judicial reform and changing the way we select our judges. Every single solicitor in this state supports the judicial reform that has been put up by these legislators. Think about that. Democrats, Republicans, men, women, black and white. Every single solicitor supports this legislation. I don't know of one sheriff who doesn't support this legislation. I've personally spoken to most of them, and I don't know of one that doesn't support it. So ask yourself this before I get rolling. Who doesn't support it and why? Ask yourself this. Who benefits from the system that we currently have in South Carolina? So I asked my good friend uh, at the very last minute, Solicitor Kevin Brackett, if he would talk about the need or the changes we need to make in how we select our judges, and he did it, and he did an absolutely phenomenal job, a fantastic job. But the most important reason I didn't wish to speak last week is because on Tuesday morning, I was involved in exposing and trying to fix a travesty, a travesty of justice that occurred to the Smalls family. Last Tuesday, we were still in the beginning stages of learning how this injustice occurred. We were just learning the facts. And what we know today is that this injustice and pain was brought upon the Smalls family caused by the inactions and actions of a solicitor, a judge, and a lawyer legislator who sits on the Judicial Merit Selection Committee and selects our judges. A JMSC lawyer who picks our judges. An injustice so blatant that I am confident that our Supreme Court is going to act swiftly to correct this wrong. And I am also very grateful, as is the Smalls family, for the Attorney General's Office's swift action in this case. So some of you might be asking, well, Pasco, what's changed? You didn't want to conflate the issue of judicial reform with the pain that's been caused by our justice system with the Smalls. What's changed? Well, what's changed is my conversation with Lily and Carl Smalls last Thursday night. Last Thursday night, Mr. and Mrs. Smalls told me, and I wrote it down right after they said it. They said, quote, as much of a nightmare as this has been, our family, to our family, as much as a nightmare as this has been to our family, and as much pain as this has caused us, we hope something good can come from this. Something good, David. We've got to change the way we pick our judges. These lawyers in the legislature have too much power with our judges. That came from the mouth of Carl Smalls. And I told them, if you're serious, I will call the legislators that I got with last week, the law firm of White, Bauer, and, and Cobb Hunter, and I'll ask them if we can have another press conference. And they said yes, because you guys, Carl Smalls is right. When legislators have the, the power to hire, fire, and completely fund the, the judiciary, the judiciary is not an independent branch of government. They work for those lawyer legislators who pick them, and that's too much power. You heard from Solicitor Kevin Brackett. He told you how lawyer legislators, and especially Judicial Merit Selection Committee members, have a lot of influence, not just in the courtroom, but in chambers. I've seen it, as I'm gonna say, talk about just a second, Representative Joseph White has seen it, and now the state of South Carolina has seen it with this secret illegal order created by a lawyer legislator and acquiesced by a solicitor and a judge. I have seen it in chambers with lawyer legislators, JMSC members. My lawyers, prosecutors have seen it. And just recently, Joseph White told me a story. He's not even a lawyer legislator. And he walked back recently to visit with the judge in chambers. And guess who was there? a member of the Ju Judicial Merit Selection Committee chumming it up with a judge back in chambers. And I'm not going to get into all the discussion, nor am I going to give you the names because it wouldn't be fair at this time. But one of the things that JMSC member made clear with Joe White in there is judicial reform is not going to happen. Well, I'm asking the people of South Carolina to prove that JMSC member wrong. But needless to say, the in-chambers secret sealed order obtained by a member of the Judicial Merit Selection Committee in this case that allowed a cold-blooded murder 
to receive an illegal reduction and release from prison cannot happen in a true justice system. How long is the madness going to outbrave the justice in the state of South Carolina? That's my question. How long is the madness going to outbrave justice in our state? Enough is enough. We have a system where in many counties, the senators who appoint the magistrates practice law in front of those same magistrates. How's that justice? But y'all, that's not even the biggest problem in our state. The biggest problem in our state is the one that Gilda Cobb Hunter, Heather Bauer, and Joseph White, and these other representatives behind me are trying to tackle, which is to take lawyer legislators off of the Judicial Merit Selection Committee and change the way we elect our circuit court judges, court of appeals judges, and Supreme Court ju justices. The JMSC routinely predetermines the outcome of judicial elections in our state. Currently, Speaker Merle Smith and Senator Luke Rankin, Chairman of the Judiciary and the Senate, appoint all 10 members of the commission, and six of the appointees are lawyer legislators. And guess who one of those appointees is? Representative Todd Rutherford, the same person who participated in chambers by his own admission in filings, it happened in chambers with a sealed secret order. And who often gets elected as judges in South Carolina? Think about this. JMSC members' spouses, their cousins, their best friends, their law partners. I think you get the point. Their legislation will go a long way in ending the practice of giving a handful of legislative insiders power to pick our state's judges. Our system is failing and people are hurting, like the Smalls. And I can't for the life of me understand why their bill doesn't have double or triple the number of sponsors it currently has. Three things I can't stand. Crime, corruption, and complacency. And complacency is the reason they don't have more sponsors. Complacency caused by a lack of courage, a lack of moral courage. Someone once said that in politics, moral courage is a rare commodity than bravery on the battlefield. And I found that to be true. They know it's wrong. Our system is hurting, but they need to show the courage in these two chambers and stand up to the leadership and pass this necessary reform. Representative Cobb Hunter alluded to this last week. You guys have no idea the courage it takes for a freshman representative in the Democratic Party like Heather Bauer to sponsor this legislation and push it with the press. Because I'm going to tell you all a little secret that you guys don't know about and I'm not supposed to know about. Heather Bauer didn't tell me this. Gilda Cobb Hunter didn't tell me this. Several weeks ago, Heather Bauer was called out among the Democrats, called out by the Democratic Party in the House of Representatives. And guess what legislator called her out? Representative Todd Rutherford. Called her out for her stance of judicial reform by the same lawyer legislator who created this secret sealed order and brought pain upon the family behind it. Think about that. Where's the fairness in that system? And Gilda, where are the Democrats? Where is our party? I'm a Democrat. Where is our party? The Democratic Party of South Carolina claims to be the party of diversity, but the Democratic Party in South Carolina in these two houses seem to be okay with the Supreme Court that has no women on it. We're the only state in the union, to my knowledge, that has no women on its Supreme Court and have only two people of color in the Court of Appeals and Supreme, Supreme Court out of 14. That's what the Democrats apparently are okay with in South Carolina. Solicitors aren't okay with it. Sheriffs aren't okay with it. The people aren't okay with it, but they're okay with it. They need to get some courage and support this legislation. And I'm almost finished. I know I've gone off a little bit more than I intended. But both the House and Senate today, y'all, both the House and Senate, you made some great points last week, in fact, with questions, but both the, the House and Senate have legislation that could be passed immediately that would give us transparency and remove the undue influence of a handful of lawmakers that they have on the judge selection process. Yes, the Senate. I have been got, getting calls this week and this morning from senators who say they have legislation that they could take up right now 
in the Senate chambers right there, pass it, and yes, get it over to the House. Even if it doesn't, they, they explain to me that if, even if it doesn't meet the crossover, they can get a special order from the majority leader, Senator Massey, and get it over to the House. But those senators tell me, David, we can't get it done because the chairman of the judiciary, Luke Rankin, won't take it up. So I'm calling on the voters of Horry County to make your center, Senator Luke Rankin, chairman of the judiciary, take this legislation up and get something passed in the Senate. The alternative, ladies and gentlemen, is to do nothing and to have another family endure the injustice and pain that Lily and Carl Smalls endured. In closing, the Smalls family trusted our judicial system, and that trust got them a phone call two hours before the release of their son's murderer, telling them that your son's murderer is about to be released from a New Mexico prison. He's so bad, we can't even keep him in South Carolina. So he's being released from a New Mexico prison and there's nothing you can do about it because of a sealed secret order. Think of the nightmare that causes two parents who lost a son. We're asking that something be done about it and we're asking that something be done about it now. But I wanna thank you again for your attention and uh, hearing me out. And uh, my good friend, Sheriff Leon Lott has a few words and then I know Mr. and Mrs. Price would like to make a statement for the media. Smalls, what did I say? Price. Price? Oh, oh, I'm sorry. sorry. No, no, no. no Mr. and Mrs. Smalls, sorry. Well, I'm a good place. For the past, <laughs> few, <laughs> past couple of years, I've um, really been talking a lot about catch and release, and I think this case is just a, a tragic example of the catch and release on how a crime is committed. We catch that person, and then they get released. Um, you know, we worry about the rights of the person arrested so much that we forget about the rights of the victims. And the smalls behind me are victims. Their son was a victim. And they're suffering. And we're not talking about that enough, I think, that the suffering that they go through, their son will never come back. Their son was murdered. And the person that murdered him was held responsible for it. We went we investigated the case, we got the evidence, it was prosecuted, a jury found him guilty, a judge sentenced him, and that's where he should have stayed, but unfortunately that did not happen. And we don't think about the pain that it causes this family, this mom and dad behind me, because their son's murderer was released. That's the crack in our, our system, that's the crack in our criminal justice system that we need to fix. We cannot continue to have victims like the Smalls family have the pain that they have when they shouldn't be having that. When someone goes out and commits a crime like Price did that killed her son, then he needs to be held accountable to the full extent of the law. That's what laws are about. It's about holding people responsible and accountable for what they've done. This case, that did not happen. And as the facts of this case and what happened comes out, I think everybody should see that there's the crack in our system that needs to be filled. And I think we have an opportunity to do that. But let's don't have any more small families or any family go through the pain and suffering that they're going now. This is the last place that they want to be is right here today. They want to be home knowing that their son's murderer is locked up and being held accountable like shit. They don't have that feeling now. He's out free. He's out in our community. He's a murderer. He's a criminal. He's a gang leader. He does not deserve to be out on our streets. That's the crack that we, all of us need to work on getting filled. So at this time, Mr. and Ms. Smalls wants to come. I think the most powerful word that you're gonna hear today is not from any of us, me standing here, is from these two parents. Good morning. My name's Carl Smalls, my wife Lily, and we come here this morning now, but first, before we get started, I want to just hold this up. This is all the appeals from Mr. Price, Gerard Price, the murderer. This is what we was going through for the last 20 years, and believe me, it, it, 
Every time you get one of these, you get the phone call, you get the robo call, but you, you get the letter a couple of days later. And you can just be just minding your own business, just having a good day, everything's going well, and you get one of these, and then your life is turned around all over again. It's day by day, and it's a stack of them. This is what we get. And um, I just want to mention what Chef Law just said just now. It's right. I mean, the far as the rights of victim, that's something I heard too many times coming up here. Well, it's his right. It's their right. It's their right. And this is their right. Appeal. And, you know, to me, I look at it as, um, I started looking at it as more of a criminal assistance system than a criminal justice system. And this is what we did. This is what we're doing with murderers like Gerard Price. We're assisting them, you know. We, it should be justice for everyone, including justice for people that's accused of murder or any crime. Justice for them, especially those that are falsely accused. But more importantly, it has to be justice for us, for the victim, and not just us as victims, but for everyone, all of you out there. And so saying that point, I just want to read a short statement that we have, that which Freeze asked, good morning. We are calling Lily Smalls. We would like to thank Solicitor, Solicitor Pasco for the invitation to be here and all the legislators and law enforcers and lawmakers who are in attendance for listening to us. This part of the nightmare of losing our son, which we call part two, started on March 15, 2023 at 11 a.m. with a phone call from Mrs. Portia Quiller of the, the, victim, of the Division of Victim Services. She told us that she has some news that would be hard to take. She proceeded to tell us that Gerard Price would be released today and we will receive an automated call at 2.30. This is 11 o'clock and she said 2.30 you'll receive a call. I mean, it was tough to take even though we knew it was coming. And we are very thankful for her for, for, let, for alerting us before this, before this happened. She told us that she felt compelled to speak to us so that we will have a human being to talk to upon receiving this horrible news. We were told that he was released, sentence amended, no probation, no supervision, no supervision or restrictions. Since this order was signed by a circuit judge, we thought that although as horrible as this was, it was a done deal and we just would have to deal with it. Once again, the rights of the criminal. We're the lawyers, we're the lawmakers, we set the laws, we set the rules, you deal with whatever we put out. On April 17th, I received a call from Deputy Chief Stan Smith asking me when did I learn of Price's release. He was shocked to learn that Price had been released a month earlier. He told me he found out the morning he called me, April 17th. Deputy Chef Smith didn't know that the killer was back on the street. Sheriff Lott didn't know that he was back on the street and neither did Solicitor Pasco know that he was on the street. This was a secret, secret deal and unlawful act. We're here today to put a face on injustice and you're looking at it, injustice, injustice and pain. And our goal are twofold. We want to ensure that in our limited power that this killer returns to prison and secondly, to use our voice to help bring about changes to the system that will prevent another family from having to endure this miscarriage of justice. And that's our main objective here today, is that we don't want somebody to go through this again. It, it never ends. Every day, it's, as time go on, you may, well, you learn to adapt because you have to. Life doesn't stop for you because you, you're, you're suffering or in pain. Life doesn't stop. But if there's anything we can do as a family to prevent another family from going through this again, and we're here. And that's why we're here. We're here to be a sounding board for you, the legislative body, to give testimony to the impact that crime has on victims and their families, and how decisions made in this body has real life, real time impact on the citizens of, citizens of South Carolina. We urge you that as a political body that you can put aside your differences and come together for the good of all South Carolinians. And like I say, it just never ends. And uh, it's, it's a different as far as for women, especially, because you know these kids are all, they, they, they're always their babies. You know, no matter, they can be 50 years old, but they're still their babies. And, then, and 
And I'm going to tell you, since hearing the news, that our life has been turned upside down. I mean, she doesn't sleep. One thing I would say that my, we're both retired and my honeydew list is real. It's non-existent right now because this woman is in bed all day. So really, I have nothing to do. But seriously, this, 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 is, this is tough. This is a bad deal. We wouldn't want anyone else to go through this. So please, the, the body, the legislative body here, work together. Work together for good. You know, so put aside the differences, Republican, Democrats, that doesn't matter anymore. It doesn't matter to us. You know, our son is in the graveyard right now. He is not coming back. Price is free. Roaming the streets, he can go back to his family. I got to go about 15 miles to a graveyard to see my son. And Mr. Price, if you're watching, and all those that was involved in this decision, I invite you to just come to Charleston. You know, it's, just come and I'll take you to where he's at. He's been there since 2002, December 14th. He's been there, that's where he's at now, and that's where he will be. So please, work together. Work together so nobody would go through this again. And we thank you for listening to us. Thank you. <clears throat> Before we take any questions, I would like to introduce a couple of people that uh, I did not introduce earlier. The rest, I think, have been introduced. First of all, this is my sheriff, Lee Foster, from Newberry County. He's been sheriff of Newberry County for 35 years. He, too, is a Democrat. But Lee started talking to me about a year and a half ago about this problem, and we continue to dialogue about it every day. And behind me here are many people of the South Carolina Freedom Caucus, we're a, a caucus within a caucus within a caucus. I mean, we are, we are a group that sticks together and tries to bring freedom to South Carolina. So thank you for listening. And anybody have any questions? Yes. Do any of you know how many convicted killers or violent criminals are secretly let out of prison and escape to the Department of Corrections to serve their sentences? Anybody keep count? No. <laughs> but I am looking into it. And... I have been made aware. I'm sorry. Uh, no, but I have been made aware of it, and I'm looking into it, and so is the Attorney General's office, because I have been made aware of potentially at least, at least three cases, but I wanna, don't want to talk about them until I have more facts. Uh, yes, we, we have. <laughs> sorry for the loss, and he really was. Um, but what we gather, he was unaware of what was going on. It wasn't his intention of letting Price out. And he just sorry for our pain and he understand. Mm -hmm. And if we have anything, any questions or comments or anything, just to talk to, to get in touch with him. But that was the essence of us. You know, he didn't, he wasn't part of it. <laughs> No, I, I, we, we had the misfortune of appearing in front of Judge Manning at, once before during the, um, the hearing for the other, the, the other murder, Ryan Brooks. And um, it didn't go well, you know, it didn't surprise me that Judge Manning is the one that is in on this also. I just really have no respect for the man. I don't, don't like him. Uh, neither actually would eliminate the committee. Uh, they would both make six of the appointments made by the executive branch of government, the governor. Right now, no executive branch involvement on the JMSC. So both bills would say that six of those appointees would have to be by the governor, two by the House, two by the Senate, and none of those could be sitting lawyer legislators. Both bills say the same thing. As far as getting away, getting getting rid of the JMSC, that takes a constitutional amendment. The Constitution set up the JMSC. Why do you feel confident that that's going to work better than it is right now? How do you, I mean, why do you feel like that's going to be a resolved issue? Will that not be more politicized, especially? Well, I go back to, to that trite saying that I said, you know, you don't let foxes guard the hen house. When lawyer legislators are the people that decide who the judges are going to be, it's a no-brainer. It's better if somebody else 
is the one, are the people that are sitting on that committee instead of lawyer legislators. It's better if the executive branch has some involvement in deciding. The executive branch oversees these guys. The executive branch oversees the sheriffs and the solicitors, and yet they have no involvement in who the judges are that these guys have to work with. So I think it's a no-brainer as far as I'm concerned, but maybe there's an argument in favor of continuing to do it this way, but we're the only state that does it this way. There's a lot of JMSCs across America. The most famous one, I think, is Missouri's. And there's some, there's some ways to set it up, but when you set it up so that lawyer legislators control it, you set it up bad. That's all I'll say about that. So. The other thing, if I could add, Mayan, is in our view, it brings about transparency and accountability to the process. And that's what all of us up here are about, and that is bringing transparency and accountability to the process. I don't think any of us, and certainly the smalls, would agree that transparency was a part of this, nor would they agree, as none of us would, that accountability is there. But I should say, on the accountability, the jury is still out, because we don't know what steps might be taken to bring some accountability to this, in this particular case. But I just want to make sure that the smalls understand that there are legislators here who believe very strongly that lawyer legislators ought not be a part of the judicial merit screening process. It's as my colleague Rep. Rep. White talked about. I mean, let's just make it plain. The system we now have allows legislators to fund through our appropriations process, to elect through the judicial merit screening and select, and then we can fire them through the voting that we do. So I don't know how anybody in their right mind thinks that this is a fair and balanced or a transparent and accountable process. I have not had another conversation since then. Uh, and, and what he suggested, and I've heard this suggestion, uh, he suggested that maybe four people be appointed by the governor. I've heard that from judges that think maybe four people should be appointed by the governor. I think the big piece is that we don't think lawyer legislators should be serving on that commission. And that's the hur hurdle. I ask this question. If there isn't some power situation, what difference does it make who sits on that commission? Why are they so protective of making sure that lawyer legislators remain in power on that? If it doesn't have any influence, why don't we just say, okay, let's go. Let's, let's make it. Let's change it. I think it's because there's so much power there. And we've got to address that. We've got to get rid of that power structure and let us be a part of the selection process but get rid of the power that's concentrated in the JMSC. And some reason, they don't want to release that power. So, Representative White, what actually has to happen? Like, you've got some bills filed on both sides of the aisle. But what needs to happen to get the people to actually act like this? Because it's clear they don't want to give up this power. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do today. I'm going to start handing out sheets that have, I'm going to give them to four, to representatives. I'm going to give them four sheets. I'm going to say, try to get these four people to sign on to one of these bills or both these bills. There's a strategy that we have to do. We have to get, first of all, I mean, we have to get it out of the Judiciary Committee. The Senate has to get theirs out of the Judiciary Committee. I've got to get ours out of the Judiciary or Heather has to get hers out of the Judiciary Committee. So you've got to get it out of the Judiciary Committee. I looked this morning. I think they're out of the 20 people on the Judiciary Committee. I think I'm right. I think 14 of those are attorneys. It's a tough hill to climb to get out of Judiciary Committee. But we, the people have to let their legislators know we want these bills out of the Judiciary Committee on the floor so the people can debate it and vote on it. That's all we have to have. Just bring it out of committee, put it on the floor, let us discuss it and vote on it. I think if that happens, we change it. But until that happens, nothing happens. Both houses, Senate, and in the house. Obviously this year is an election year for everybody. Mm -hmm. Do you believe that this is an issue that is going to be able to sway voters to go vote candidates or vote in those ballot boxes? Obviously, if you're having an issue changing the judiciary or getting the judiciary committee to hear it, then you gotta change who's on the judiciary too, right? So do you think that this is enough to move voters in the primary in December? 
I think it influences. I think those people who are not willing to bring this out of committee uh, have to answer to their constituents. So I think it influences it. I don't think it, it necessarily changes it. But if, if I were one of those that's on the Judiciary Committee and I was running for re-election next year and somebody came to me and said, why didn't you bring those bills out of committee? They'd have to answer that, wouldn't they? So I think it would influence the election, I do. It is absolutely one of our main priorities. It, it always has been, and we're not the only ones. You see there's Democrats up here. Um, justice matters to everyone. It's, it's bipartisan, and one party doesn't have uh, you know, control or I get to claim that. Um, I actually also want to speak to, I am a lawyer legislator. I believe I'm the only one up here. I know I'm not the only one who supports this. Oh, Ryan's also a lawyer legislator. We have two. Um, we're not here to denigrate the profession. Uh, being a lawyer is a noble profession, but this kind of thing, what we've just heard about, the influence that they have over the selection of judges, that damages the profession. It doesn't pass the smell test. Allowing us to control the judges and influence them when we go and practice before them is fundamentally flawed. It's problematic. It doesn't pass the smell test. I think fixing that and making sure that these kind of travesties of justice do not occur will do far more uh, to uh, helping the profession uh, than harming it. And I hope people in both chambers, lawyer, legislators, will actually join and lead this fight because it's long overdue. We'd be in favor of an investigation throughout this whole process, everyone involved. And I, I mean, is that the question? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, we definitely would be in favor of it. We, we need investigation of the ones that um, signed this order, that signed, that, that, that signed this deal secretly, every one of them. All, all members of the bar still have to answer to the Office of Disciplinary Council, and also he would still have to answer to the Judicial Commission. So there could be consequences. Um, certainly, there could be consequences if he wants to retire in place and be on the bench uh, again. So, hey, can I say something? Right? Yeah. Um, you know, it just seems like um, between all the people involved in this all day, it, it just too many years of law experience to do something this idiotic. 100 years. 100 years to sign something like that. You know, my 14-year-old grandson would probably look at it and, and wouldn't get himself involved in something like this. I don't get it. So yes, investigate all of them. And I also believe that the law records, the, the, the ju judicial record for Judge Manning, and Mr. Rutherford, that it be examined. It's to see who else didn't screw it over. <laughs>